While I have been expecting some news regarding 5.5, I didn't see this coming at all. To quote, 1D&D is the code name for the next generation <coughs> edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Last week, and from now on, basically every month they will release playtest material for 1D&D. Expect to see more videos from me and other YouTubers in the future to talk about everything that is coming out. Welcome to Pack Tactics. We are number one. Hey! Now listen closely. The first playtest is about the origins of characters. So basically what you have to do, mechanically, mechanically to begin playing. For the purposes of this video, I will assume you have read this new form of UA, and I'll just give my opinions on what has been provided. Pause the video and check the comments for a link if you haven't read it already. To make this video a bit more manageable, I will try to split it up into segments or chapters, trying to keep each one talking about different parts of this playtest. You can basically divide the playtest among who your character is, feats, and miscellaneous changes to the rules in the rules glossary. For the purposes of this playtest, the material mentioned uses the rules of the player handbook, except where it's stated otherwise. I believe in the end we will have a complete playtest. For now, you will be able to provide feedback almost every month. Surveys will be released around two weeks after each new playtest and will remain live for another two weeks. It's very important you give feedback this time, if you care about this game. I'm gonna give feedback because I love this game. We'll start off with races, legacies, lineages, and backgrounds. We know lineages and legacies as sub-races currently. The currently provided races that should be familiar to you are human, dragonborn, dwarf, Elf, Gnome, Halfling, Orc, and Tiefling. Additionally, they have showcased the Ardling, basically a counterpart to Tiefling from the Upper Plains. I think some of you guys might like this one a lot for <laughs> reasons. Yes, Gator, they are. Importantly, in this current iteration, races and backgrounds have changed in one big way. Ability score increases now no longer come from races, but instead backgrounds. If you ask me, this is only a logical continuation of the path Wizards of the Coast chose after Tasha's, basically making ability scores no longer tied to race through the customizing your origins optional rule. In my opinion, with how 5e's ability scores currently work, it makes sense to do away entirely with this limitation to players. And I'm very happy to see it's no longer an optional rule. It also makes sense to move it away from races, as there really was no connection between the two things anymore. This also seems in line with Wizards of the Coast's claim to wanting to move away from races needing to follow a specific image of a setting. For example, orcs need to be strong. Kobolds need to be weak. However, I'm not completely happy with how that has been pursued now. We just don't find it here, but also in the recently released GIF, most if not all culturally significant features from races that Wizards of the Coast wants to keep are being moved to being given by the divine or similar. Like take for example the dragonborn, they instinctively know the language of dragons. Or the dwarves, their divine creator gave them an uncanny affinity for working with stone or metal. All gnomes are supernaturally cunning and all halflings are supernaturally brave. I think for Wizards of the Coast to actually provide us with what they seemingly promised, we need to split up the mechanics of origins in one more section. We currently have biology through race, but also this seemingly shoehorn culture, and then personal experience through your background. Let's take a quick detour and look at how another system does it. Icon, which is currently in playtest, made by Massive Press. In Icon, you pick a kin, or in D&D terms, race, a culture, and a bond, which I would say is similar to a D&D background. I will now quote two sections which should paint a picture about how this all works in Icon. 
Collective peoples and folk of Icon are collectively referred to as kin. Kin have lived in Arden Eld since time immemorial. When you make a character, choose what kin type you are. There's no statistical or mechanical differences in game terms for whatever kin you pick. For example, that Trogs as a whole are larger and stronger than most Thryn. However, each individual is different, and more importantly, you are a hero. Your bond is more important for determining the kind of kin you are. If you want to play up the unique attributes of your kin, you can pick a bond that fits that fantasy, and pick actions that fill out what you want your character to be strong at. A strong, physically powerful trog may want to pick the mighty bond. An agile Sixu, who is an excellent swimmer, may pick the pathfinder bond. Broadly speaking, members of all kin can be found in every part of the world and every walk of life in Icon, and none have any ancestral nation, homeland, or monoculture, especially due to the ancient influence of the Arkan Empire. And then we got this. Culture is far more important than kinship. A trog and a sixo from the same village are far more alike than two trogs from different parts of the world. These are the six broad cultures of Arden Elds, and don't necessarily represent every culture present in the world. Every type of kin is present in every culture in varying degrees. I don't think you can just completely paste these ideas from Icon into one D&D. Like in Icon, races have no mechanics. But in D&D, they probably should at least have rules for stuff they get from their biology. However, I believe the culture section is missing. D&D should allow people to be good smiths through their culture, and then open up the options for a setting where dwarves commonly have that culture, but also other options. I'm not a fan of saying, well, the gods made you this way, bud. You'll have to deal with it. It might be fitting in some places for your backstory, but I think it's weird for your race. I think backgrounds are basically as I want them to be. I'm a big fan of adding more oomph to low-level characters. So giving out a feat to everyone is definitely something I enjoy. I've seen a few people complain about the languages the simple backgrounds give in relation to what they're portraying, but remember, they are examples. The idea, even more so than 5e, is that you yourself make your background as you want it to be. Another interesting element is that everyone gets the same amount of gold for their starting equipment. You might think that that's insane. But I believe it streamlines things and allows you to make up a cool reason why. Maybe the urchin found part of their starting gold in the noble's pockets. If I had to complain about anything, it's that you cannot choose to go for two tool proficiencies or two languages instead of one of each, but it's not a big deal. Now for feats, I would go in a lot of detail if I didn't know this video would be so incredibly long already, but I'll just keep it short and sweet. I am of the opinion that the general idea of level granting feats can theoretically be fine. However, you need to know how options compare to one another. This playtest does not make me very hopeful as the difference in power between the feats just at level 1 are immense. Just look at Magic Initiate, Lucky and Alert, and compare it to the others. That is not okay. None of the good martial feats are here at level 1. If there's no changes to martials that buff their damage capabilities, this is not good at all. This is the time to support the martials if you actually care about them. Finally, for the rules glossary, let's talk about the most controversial change of this playtest, the D20 test. I'll go through this step by step. A D20 test is an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw. I like that there's some guidance around when to ask for an ability check, but I don't believe this is the right direction, especially combined with the rules for critical success and failures. DCs higher than 30 can 
definitely happen. And even at level one, you can find ways to make them by being creative. I think such a challenge is cool, but I don't think this adds much to the game. If it stays, I would at least like to see the wording change so that it is explicit to what happens when you fight something with an AC below five, which can happen. Next is critical failures. A one on the D20 test leads to an automatic failure, no matter how great your bonuses are. I believe that this is not a good change. Investing in succeeding on a test should pay off. A test you would succeed on even on a natural one should not be rolled. This constant 5% chance to fail is just annoying. Critical successes make every 20 on a d20 test automatically succeed. I believe that this should be changed too. Currently, the limit to roll is a DC 30. From what I can interpret, that is meant as possible. However, when someone now asks to roll for such a check and they have a minus one to the roll, they still have a 5% chance to succeed. I really don't like this. I think this is so dumb. And it again makes investing in a test less useful. It feels very random in a way I don't like. This doesn't even get into the unclarity regarding what a success means for ability checks, like initiative or opposing ability checks. Maybe those rules have changed as well, but I don't know. I have seen positive feedback for critical successes for saving throws. I get the reason. The DCs for saving throws grow insanely quick, whereas without a paladin, the bonuses are almost stagnant for players. I agree that this sucks, especially especially with impossible to beat DCs at higher levels, but they could fix this by changing how your bonuses grow instead. All in all, I would like to see these parts of the rules changed as currently this leads to people with a plus 14 modifier failing a DC six test and people with a minus one modifier succeeding on a DC 30. To elaborate on what I would like to see, let's look at the burning wheel by Luke Crane. Here are just a few of the system agnostic unambiguously good parts from its ability check rules. Before a check, the player must state their intent, what they want to happen on a success. The player must state a task, the means with which they want to fulfill the intent. The DM announces the consequences of failure in broad strokes before the dice are rolled. A failure complicates the situation, it is never nothing happens. They have something called let it ride. A player shall test once against a DC and shall not roll until conditions legitimately and drastically change. Neither DM nor player can call for a retest unless those conditions change. A DM cannot call for multiple rolls of the same ability to accomplish a player's stated intent. Nor can a player retest a failed roll simply because they failed. If there's nothing at stake or there's no reasonable consequence of failure that advances the story, the DM says yes or no and the intent succeeds or fails automatically as appropriate to the situation. In other words, you could take a step forward in your bedroom. You do not know about the king's illness because he is not ill. Something I quickly skipped is the addition to how inspiration can be given. Every time you roll a natural 20, you get inspiration to a maximum of one. I don't like this for many reasons. Number one, it's easily abusable. Currently, you could just smack the ground, run over caltrops, and stuff like that until you roll a 20. Number two, mechanics should incentivize certain behavior. You don't need to incentivize people to roll more in this game. In general, I think it's weird that they're seemingly moving away from being rewarded for role-playing well, because it was too hard to remember. Well, again, take a look at how Burning Wheel does it, as it works better than just giving inspiration every 20 tests. Also, this is not the buff you believe it is for marshals. It is a slight DPR increase, but if you do the math for it, it's quite laughable, especially if you take into account the marshal feats that are missing from this playtest. 
Now for critical hits. The design idea here confuses me. First, they want to make saving throws, ability checks, and attack rolls as similar as they can so people don't get confused. But they made critical hits different for basically everyone. I think the changes to monster crits is fine mechanically, especially at low levels where PCs just went splat. But it sucks in play for a DM if the players get something on the natural 20, but they just have to reminisce about the old times. I think a better direction would be to buff the hit points of a player at level 1 so they don't just get one shot by any crits. For players, I think the rules are messy. A warlock at level 20 loses 1.1 DPR due to this nerf with Eldritch Blast. It's inconsequential. It's barely a nerf. But then they seemingly removed smites and sneak attack doing crit damage. That is a gigantic hit to marshals, and I hope they clarify what exactly they mean with the damage dice of a weapon. That nerf to marshals actually worries me the most out of this playtest. Next, for the tools. I almost like their changes. Advantage on checks if you have proficiency in the tool, and fitting skill is also in Xanathar's. But there, it's an optional rule. As for making the costs the same per category, it removes some realism, but ah, uh, it doesn't matter too much. Next up, condition changes. Thank you, Wizards of the Coast. The incapacitated condition now includes the text, your concentration is broken. This is not a mechanical change, but it used to be in a whole other chapter than the incapacitated condition. It was really annoying. I think the speechless part is fine too, but I'm not really sure about the surprised part. It seems fine, but I surely hope this is not replacing surprise because this is not the fix it needs. The slowed condition is a weird one. I expected it to be like the slow ability from a stone golem or Tash's mind whip, but it isn't. I have no idea what this will be used for exactly in the future, but I'm definitely not a fan that you get slowed when you move someone you have grappled now. Speaking of that, it's a bit weird that they say tiny or two size smaller. I think two size smaller is probably fine by itself. The way they changed how you escape is interesting. It makes strength saving throws a bit more useful. But I wonder, are there still reasons to pick up athletics and acrobatics proficiencies anymore? They used to kind of be attacks that your character needed to pick up to escape grapples. Without any other insight, I think the change to escape is probably a good one. Speaking of grappling, they have changed that too to be done through unarmored strike. On the one hand, I think it's an elegant change, but on the other, it has a few issues. Particularly at tables with high optimization builds, casting a big concentration spell and then dodging with high AC and the shield spell is a very, very strong strategy, as it becomes incredibly hard for you to be hit. One counter strategy to this is to grapple the caster, as they can no longer gain the benefit from dodge. But with this current change, you need to hit the caster as a DM before you can make them less harder to hit, which can definitely be a challenge. If they're nerfing caster sturdiness, I see this as a good change, but currently I feel as if it can lead to casters becoming even sturdier in play. Right now, it's a nerf to marshals, not a boost. The casters got boosted here. But while we're at casters, let's talk about spells. There are now three main spell lists in the game, mainly arcane spells for artificers, bards, sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards, divine spells, spells for clerics and paladins, and finally, primal spells for druids and rangers. In this playtest, we got to see the lists of cantrips and first level spells. How exactly these lists will be used is going to be explained in the future. In addition, you will be able to get spells from another list somehow, some way. I've got an overview of what spells are new for classes and what spells aren't found on spell lists, which classes originally got access to in the player's handbook. Don't freak out though, to quote the interview with Crawford upon release. 
classes are going to use those lists, but classes are also going to have access to spells that go beyond those universal lists. Some have gained more spells than others, notably Wizard, who only got four extra spells so far. Not that there were many spells left to give. We can also see that Paladins and Rangers, who didn't have access to cantrips at all in the player handbook, do have access to them here. I don't know to what extent, but it is interesting. In general, this change leads to quite a lot of homogeneity. I am hopeful that the classes remain with some form of identity as a lot of it gets removed this way. On the other hand, this should make things a bit easier for the player base, which is good. The last part of this UA I'll talk about is also the last part of a long day. A long rest. They changed the wording a tiny bit, and also the mechanics. To start, I'll say what I like. Getting the benefits of a short rest if your long rest is interrupted is a good idea. I think many people already use that as a house rule. Now for what I would like to see changed in the future. I am still of the opinion that getting half your hit dice back on a long rest is not optimal. It's annoying to track, and I think it would be way better if you got all of them back. This does add some hit point blouts, but a counter to that is to require hit dice to be spent when you get healed in other ways, like what they did with the healer feats. Additionally, I hope they either make it clear that rest casting works or just remove it entirely. The current wording and the wording here just leads to conflicts at a table due to disagreements. Moonsilver suggested a change in Tabletop Builds Discord that I thought was pretty interesting. Don't let spell slots be regained if they are spent on an effect that is still persisting. Make exceptions for appropriate spells like Teleportation Circle. There might be issues with that, but I haven't really thought about it all too much. Either way, clean up the wording. Lastly, I'm not a fan of any combat leading to a long rest needing to be restarted. I'm not really sure what made them want to change long rest this way. I, I guess this encourages people to get to safer places. But in the current state of the game, you just place down tiny huts. I would like to see this removed in favor of changing casting during long rests. My final take for this video is that we don't have enough content to actually playtest one D&D. And I hope that in future iterations, they can give us enough so I can actually play the game, even if it is not everything. But that's basically everything I wanted to talk about. If you like this kind of video, make sure to leave a comment so that I can see. Also, if you think I should go more in depth, for some parts, let me know. Just a final reminder, if you care about the future of D&D, you have to give feedback this time. Wizards of the Coast has made the world's greatest role-playing game, and some of us have been playing this system for a very, very long time. If we play our cards right, we might make this system even greater. End of video. I hope I earned your subscription and thank Thank you for watching. Bye bye.